had a couple of statements I would like to make. First of all, I wanna thank Paul McCullough and the county staff for working with us on some very short notice to allow us to use this building for the meeting. We usually have our meetings in the schools and schools are in session today. So um, we appreciate their help in working with us. Um, secondly, uh, some of you may not know, we had a bus accident this morning, um, fairly serious accident, but all of our children are okay. They've been checked out. And um, if you're so inclined, I would just send up a quick thank you prayer and maybe at the same time say a prayer for the victim in the, or the driver of the car. I think there was some, he did walk away from the hospital though, I believe, but you know, just a quick thank you wouldn't hurt. And thank a bus driver too, because from what I've heard, she was she an was, absolute rock star. She was a rock star. Now, our driver. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Brand new driver, three days on the job. And uh, so, yeah, kudos to her and to our trainers who do a great job, obviously. Okay, with all of that, I wanna just take a brief moment to address the community and everybody present today. We are meeting here to discuss Governor Northam's announcement yesterday of a public health order that requires universal, universal masking in K-12 settings. The board appreciates invol community involvement and encourages it. It is important for me to note that today we will not have citizens time because this meeting is just a work session. However, please know that we hear you, respect your opinions, and appreciate your unwavering support. We have received um, a number of emails in the last 24 hours. Keep them coming, that's fine. We may just, I haven't had the time to respond, and I, I would guess everybody else is the same. Um, as we move forward today in our discussion, it's important that we maintain an orderly meeting. Please be respectful, show some decorum, refrain from loud outbursts and disruptive behavior. We have a number of deputies on site just to make sure that we behave like we are supposed to. Um, prior to moving to a board discussion, I encourage you and those viewing our meeting today to continue to voice your concerns to decision makers at the state level. It is extremely important that they hear from you directly as a parent and a citizen of the Commonwealth. Okay, with that, are you gonna, Dr. Jack, are you gonna lead this discussion? Uh, I can share yeah. what I've read and what I was yeah. told during a conversation or phone call with the state superintendent. Uh, we were informed that this was coming um, and uh, essentially the the purpose of the order um and it was what it was a little ironic was the order didn't come from the governor the order came from uh, the health commissioner which was a little bit unusual and that's not what any of us were expecting um but uh the conversation really centered around uh the desire at the state level to get school divisions in line essentially and that's what the order was about and that's what um that was what was explained to us. And so since then, we of course received the news release from the governor's office. Um, we've also received the order itself from the state health commission, which is, is very clear, uh, it's mm -hmm. very straightforward. Um, and we've also been reviewed with principals and um, <coughs> senior staff and the school board, the statute related to um, um, Code of Virginia 32.1 dash 27, which I think you're gonna be referring to during your comments. So that's where we are today. Uh, we, were, we asked the state superintendent um, when the order was going into effect. And he said, as soon as the commissioner's signature hit the paper, it was in effect, which again, is one of those situations where that put every school division in a very difficult spot because uh, that's not something you suddenly spring on people um, so, but that was part of the information we received. And last but not least, um, I asked the question of the state superintendent, 
uh, why uh, why the the order come, came from the commissioner, why the order didn't come from the governor, and was the commissioner's order on par and in the same uh, with the same authority as a governor's order? And the answer was yes, that they have carried the same authority. And he quoted 32.1-27 to declare Virginia. So that brings us to where we are now. I called Donna, called a couple of other superintendents who um, are sort of taking the same tact we are as a school division, see what they were planning to do, and uh, we, we suggested that we hold an emergency meeting. Okay. All right, so I will open up questions for Dr. Jack comments somebody want to take it go ahead i have a question that sure. one of my constituents asked me just before i got here he says is this meeting uh, a meeting to seek interpretation uh of some of the language that's in the governor's uh, most recent release or is it a meeting to poke holes in the mandate and look for loopholes i told her that i would ask that question I think the order is written the way it's written yeah. and every citizen can read the mandate and if they have questions about interpretation they can reach out to their school board member or reach out to the superintendent i would say reach out to the health state health commissioner yeah i would agree with that because in some of the ways that it's written um how do you quantify what sincerity is how do you interpret that how do you quantify what is a sincerely held religious belief? I believe is what. Point, yes. Point, point in the case. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I didn't run for school board, so I could judge people's serious religious beliefs. Exactly. So that wasn't that wasn't part of my job description. Well, that that was part of our com the conversation Don and I just had with the school board attorney, which I think there's disagreement amongst school board attorneys as to what some of the language actually means. So they're, they're, they continue to talk to one another. And the comments, uh, or excuse me, the language in the order, for example, relative to uh, health conditions and um, sincerely held religious beliefs, uh, right now those are up, they're subject to interpretation. They're uh, for the most, for, to a large extent, not completely. But um, those pieces are still part of the dis ongoing discussion amongst school board attorneys. So it's kind of left to us at this point to interpret it and provide for opt-outs as we feel is appropriate and legal. Um, but the other pieces of the order are very clear. Uh, that was that was my view in terms of what this governor said and what the order states. But there are a couple pieces that I mentioned that are still a little ambiguous, but we can't leave parents in a lurch between now and, and you know Monday, for example. We gotta let them know exactly what uh, what we're doing, what the expectations are, et cetera. Okay, well, and, and um, one of the things that I went to, these would be exceptions to this order, and I'm sure most of you have read this, and we know that eating, drinking, exercising, um, playing a musical interest, instrument, any person who has trouble breathing, um, any person with an IEP or 504 plan under the Rehabilitation Act where wearing a mask would inhibit communication or the receiving of services. Um, we go down to G, nothing in this order shall require the use of a mask by any person for whom doing so would be contrary to his or her health or safety because of a medical condition. So I know from the emails that I did read, there are parents saying, my child has a medical exemption. Please be, this is your notification. Mm -hmm. So moving forward, I think we need to make that as easy as possible for parents to do that. And that would be the same thing um, any person at the end of that section, any person who declines to wear a mask because of a medical condition or any person with a sincerely held religious objection to wearing masks in school may request a reasonable accommodation. Um, if we can have staff prepare something 
We are, we're working on it now. Um, that would be very easy for parents to, my child has a medical condition. Is, 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 and, that, is that all it's going to take is for a parent to say, my we, child has a medical condition, that's it? From um, the conversation with the attorney a few minutes ago, and in reading all the language, we believe that is correct, Mr. Bland. But the information we received was um, the information we received from the attorney and what we've read. We're not we are not able to have a parent, the child comes into a school and with a note from a parent, for example, and I don't know what the mechanism is going to be to record and track this, but, but we're going to come up with one. But if if that's provided by the parent, a we, we can't require any documentation. And B, we can't ask what the specific um, condition. condition is. So um, that's, that's difficult, that's and we don't. And frankly, yeah. we don't want to put school that's staff. That's point, right. yeah, we don't want to put school staff in a position where they're having to pick and choose. But I, I would say that I mean, you know, the, the, our school admin and teachers they're gonna they're gonna do the absolute best that they can, and they have done the absolute best that they can. Their their job is to teach. And their their job is to sit look out for the welfare of, of kids, and uh, and they take that job very seriously. So, um, you know, the, the the bus accident this morning was just a really it was an excellent reminder of uh, how important safety the safety of our student is. And um, I, I was able to watch the film, and it was awful. Um, so, student safety is extremely important, but. Um, the way this section is written, it's again prima facie. It's very clear. If it doesn't, it doesn't even say serious medical condition, it no. says medical condition. And by law, we're not allowed to ask specifically what it is or ask for documentation. What, uh, Ms. Grove, the other part, but mm -hmm. seriously about, about the Sim religious exemption, right? What what defines seriously? That's sincerely. And that's what, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what um, Susan was saying. It, they they've left. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. And that's what the attorneys are struggling with yeah. to try to find answers to these questions. Um, there's. Yeah. I want to make sure that we highlight what we're talking about as far as boundaries. So I, I know that you read it, but we're talking about eating, drinking exercising so that includes PE, gym class gym class and inside or outside the order says any any act inside individuals you're inside a building right k-12 public building uh, school building you are to wear masks but it also says the exceptions to this order include individuals exercising or using exercise equipment so if you're in pe in the gym you do not need to wear your mask uh, I would have to, I'd have to take a look at that again because uh, I'll take a look at it again. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a tricky one there. You're inside. It doesn't make any difference. That's an exception. It's listed as an exception to this order. Yeah. Where are you reading from? Uh, the, it's a the three page state health commissioner's order. It's that one. Oh, this, okay. It's, yeah, it's that one. Page 2B. Yeah, it doesn't say inside or outside. So if you're exercising, be exercising inside or outside. Right. Right. He's got it right. Are you reading this from is, something different? Well, it's from VDOE. Anticipated yes. questions. <laughs> Do students have to wait a minute? Wait a minute. From, from the health. It's from the health department. That's from the health department. Uh, and make sure I'm reading the right question here. Do students have to wear a mask while playing school sports? Is that the question? So the answer to that is the order does not, does allow for exemptions when students are exercising or using exercise equipment, but masks are strongly encouraged. Could we make sure just for the people who aren't in the room, um, could we introduce April? I mean, I just want to make sure that people know that when we're looking over to the side where we're getting, who we're, who we're dialoguing with. <laughs> this um, is April Octor is with the, our, our representative for the Virginia uh, BDH, yeah, and she represents uh, Fakir, Culpepper, and Rappahannock. 
and Madison, Madison Orange. So she's got our region. Okay. So, and then also, then also we're clarifying that outside, um, that outside on property in the parking lot, they're able to not wear a mask, correct? correct. And also in sports activities, um, on and off the field. Um, correct. Okay. Sure. Hey, come to the microphone if you would, please. Thank you. So outdoors, it does not fall under the order. However, if they can be spaced, that is the recommendation to sure. reduce their risk. And then the other thing is just talking about what we saw last year and how we saw our cases. It's not the time on the field, it's the risk. It's the time over on the sideline huddled together. So even though it is not part of the order, a best practice to keep these kids healthy would be if they're huddled up to have them have their mask on. Okay, thank you. Okay, some more clarification. Or um, so maybe we should switch it to clarification of when we're expecting students to wear masks. And so that would be from the moment they get on the bus, um, because that is under a federal mandate for transportation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we are um, looking from the moment they enter a school building, unless they're eating, drinking, exercising. Um, have a medical or have a, a medical religious. or religious exemption. Um, but I also wanna make sure we highlight our IEP services. Um, I had a parent reach out to me very, very concerned. Uh, their, um, their child is hearing impaired. And it's not a question about whether or not their child wears a mask. It's a question about their peers and their instructors wearing a mask. That um, they're perfectly fine with their, with their child wearing a mask, but um, it isolates that child if the, they're not able to communicate with their peers and they're not able to communicate with their instructor. And, uh, you know, I don't know what kind of accommodations we need to make in that situation, uh, but if we're looking at what every child needs in order to thrive in our schools, I think we have to have an ongoing dialogue about our children, um, you know, our hearing impaired learning and what do they need in their learning environment in order to thrive. And, you know, we need to make sure that our, our, um, our IEP children, our children that need special accommodations are at the forefront of this conversation. Right. A hearing impaired, for instance, needs someone, uh, needs a teacher with no mask on. Right, and we, and, you know, I think last year there was some allowance with um, with shields and and I know that that it's now been determined that shields are ineffective. So what what is our what's our option in a classroom with a child that actually needs to be able to communicate by seeing by seeing mouths and faces? So uh, we we had a handful of students okay um, use that uh, and there was students on the autism spectrum, for example, or okay. in in uh, speech hearing. Uh, we had a handful of students who utilized the, the shields, and I, I don't re recall there being any issues with that. Um, but that was one that was based that was an accommodation essentially. Okay. And the teacher also, in those shield. situations, would have to wear a shield also. And when we are talking about the medical and the religious exemption, this this does include staff as well. So this yeah. is student mm -hmm. and staff. Yes. Yeah, that was, I wanted to come back and okay. make that point. Yes, that this says persons with. Um, health conditions that prohibit wearing men. Nothing in this order shall require the use of a mask by any person. It doesn't say student, but it says any person. So mm -hmm. we want to make sure that, Frank, yeah. you want to come? Sorry. <laughs> Just stepping back to the issue that, that um, Ms. Pauling brought up is it does help if the teacher is vaccinated. So if the teacher doesn't have to you know the ability to wear a mask because it's detrimental to the student for learning purposes that will create some degree of a fair right so just bear that in mind so. okay thank you and and hipaa you know hipaa obviously is applied to staff as well as students so those those protections are in place for all persons so that's another thing we need to keep in mind 
So I would like to um, to just also make note, and this is well, a couple a couple things I'd like to say is that um, first, and and I think that I would just need April to confirm this is the silver lining of a masking policy is that it changes our expectations for quarantine. That if a student has on a mask and the children in the room have on a mask, then we do not have to quarantine those children. And so I'm I'm not one, uh, you know, I'm, I obviously already voted for this to be a parent decision, but I'm trying to, to add a silver lining to this situation is that it will minimize uh, quarantines, it will minimize teachers having to quarantine. Um, and, you know, the goal is for children to be in school five days a week and to have um, to have them in the classroom. And, uh, you know, I've been I've been trying to look for the silver lining for, uh, I would say, probably a month in all of this dialogue. Uh, but uh, one thing I think that is important to remember that there are two sides to um, this position of masking mandates or not mandating. And uh, I really do appreciate the fact that Duke gave the other, gave a different perspective on Monday night, because I think one thing that we've lost in this dialogue is the ability to actually listen to people and dialogue and converse. And I think that when we have a student and um, you know, a high school student and a middle school student willing to come and share about how they feel personally about a mask mandate. And when people in our community are booing them and telling them to sit down, it's, it's mortifying because they're a right to their opinion and, they're, and they have a right to their voice. And when we've lost all decency as grownups in the room to allow our children to express how they feel I, I think that we're falling short as adults leading by example. And so I'm sorry if you, like this situation is not where we wanted to sit. I did not want to sit here because honestly, anytime the word mandate is issued, like when the, when the federal government is, issues a mandate for the states, I believe it's an overreach. Anytime that there's a mandate from the governor to the localities, I think it's an overreach. And any time a school board mandates to a family, I believe it's an overreach. But also understanding that these are the these are the guidelines we have to operate in. And um, I, I would just like to encourage everyone, we've got to change how we're communicating in our community. And when we have students from our school division come and speak in citizens time, we should be applauding them for using their voice to speak how they feel, not booing them and telling them to sit down. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just, I think we've got to change how we dialogue as grownups. And we need to lead because our kids are watching. Thank you. Very well said, Ms. Paul. Thank you. Yeah, April. Thank you for saying that. Um, just one follow up on your, your comment about quarantine of these kids and that from our perspective, you know, Daniel and I both had kids in the school system and we want them to stay in school. Right. If all of the kids are masked, then that rule applies. But if you have a group of kids and one of the kids is not masked, then the rule doesn't apply any longer. And so we want to keep that in mind when we talk about how we're going to implement the policy. Mm -hmm. If our goal is number one, keeping these kids from getting sick, and number two, keeping the bottoms in the chairs and getting them educated. We need to consider all of that when you have your discussion. I, I appreciate that, April. But when this gives parents the opportunity to file an exemption, a medical exemption, so you have a child in that classroom who legally has the exemption not to wear a mask, then that puts everybody mm -hmm. in an awful place. We feel you. We got this news at the same time that you did yesterday. Yeah. Right. So we, we are all in this together. Um, that's when we start to apply layered mitigation. Right. So if, if there's a student and they have a medical exemption and they cannot wear the mask, maybe we can distance them. And then if we have six feet of distance, then maybe that's an option. Uh, yeah, I, I know. There's no, the, the there's way, no right answer. There's no good there's answer. There's no good answer, but the no. way the disease spreads is person to person. 
and these are the strategies that work. Okay, thank you. I have a statement to read. Sure. Um, I don't know how many people saw the Washington Post article this morning that specifically called out Fauquier County, but um, I have a statement. Mr. Governor, we did not require additional clarity. We were crystal clear on what we were mandated to do. The problem is you need clarity on why we are pushing back. This is not a one size fits all situation. The amount of contradictory data and studies, and in some cases lack thereof, are overwhelming. There is a reason why our communities are distrustful, why they don't think their government is being truthful or transparent. Pay attention to this study, but not that one. Listen to this statistic, but ignore this one. You do not live in this community. You do not know the little boy with the hearing deficit that has been completely isolated for the last year and a half because he can't see his classmates and teacher's face and therefore cannot effectively communicate. You do not know the teacher that went against the medical advice of her doctor, putting her own pulmonary health at risk due to a mandate that didn't take into account the fact that while we do need to be concerned with the greater good, there are individual circumstances for each and every person. You do not know the students or staff that have suffered anxiety episodes attributed to the masks, either for or against. Who are any of us to tell anybody your anxiety doesn't matter? It's unimportant. It's more, infor more important for you to make me feel safe. You have forced our community to turn on each other with a vengeance. Neighbors and friends judging each other, each other over whether or not their health concerns or mental health issues are real. We know these people. We talk and we listen to every single person that comes to us in our local community, all of whom have a right to an opinion and the right to voice their concerns. In addition, we followed the CDC guidelines throughout most of last year because that's what we were told to do. The CDC handed us the rules that all but forced the virtualization of our schools last year, and that has now been generally accepted as a terrible decision. Your heavy-handed shutdown at the entire state of the beginning of this pandemic likely did more damage than good, but there's no study to, to determine that, just the aftermath. These guidelines and mandates have taken the control completely out of the hands of the local governments, the very governments who know their people and know their local issues, but we're supposed to trust you've got it right this time. Thank you. Um, I just, I will, I will. There's a number of, of things that obviously that bother me about this, but um, there's no end point. It says when the CDC changes their recommendations, their recommendations are for the entire country. For the what, year. For, right. So, we uh, parents went out and got their 12 year old and older they got them vaccinated so they could send them to school with no masks on right and we have i don't know what the percentage in the county that's vaccinated now but there's localities in the country that are less than 20 percent i believe but these cdc recommendations are for everybody they need to say for localities to be able to do what's best for them. And that's that's one of the things that really bothers me about this. We're going to be losing students. We've already heard from parents who are pulling their kids out of public schools. And that's not good. When you talk about the health of, and safety of students, you've got to think about their overall health. And this, I'm sick about this. They waited until schools were open. They didn't do this to give schools and parents, parents who have already made decisions for this year based upon what we were saying. And they waited until parents had made those decisions and then come out with this. And don't give parents any time to process it and decide what's best for their family. This is mandated now, boom. Also remember that they did this last year when they said that it was up to the localities and then privately said that if we strayed from it, that we would be held responsible because it would be seen as gross negligence. Mm -hmm. And they did the same thing this year when they gave us the guidance and said that each locality could decide and now giving us a mandate because we didn't do what they wanted. And um, I would like to say that everybody's okay with the mandate as long as it's the one that you agree with, but right. what happens with the next mandate? And what happens when 
it's not going to just stay with our schools oh, no. and, and it's going to move into our community and i know that people are looking for the school board for us five to stand up and say like this this isn't right but i think that that at some point in time like you had said in the very beginning our 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 issue is with richmond and this is not this is being taken out of the locality out of our hands this is being directed and mandated by richmond and i think that that our constituents need to know that that um, every email you send to us you need to send to richmond and you need to start going to the source because at this point in time we weren't brought to the table of this conversation our conversation was on monday and we voted and our voices were heard and then our voices were were, neg were negated um for anybody that didn't have an opportunity to look under that section 32.1-27 um, it goes through the penalties and um i don't think that we have an extra twenty five thousand dollars laying around to um pay to the courts for a civil penalty for each time we violate this law and that's in section c so um with that is there any, any more anything else anybody no I, I, I just want to uh, take a moment and, and and say look i realize that there are a number of students staff members that have legitimate medical exceptions right. this addresses that there are a number of folks who have religious uh exceptions i can understand and appreciate that my only concern is for those folks who don't have legitimate uh reasons to not wear masks use these as an excuse not to and well, that, that, okay. I, I know I, there's no way that we can right. we, we can police that or anything but i'm i'm just pleading with the public i'm pleading with the public i said hey don't do it folks i, I appreciate okay. that yeah. however who am i to say what is a legitimate health concern of any parent that parent deals with that child and when that it goes parent knows. Home. and that parent knows that parent knows whether they're dealing with anxiety isolation I, I agree with you uh, um, suicide thoughts mm -hmm. um depression uh, shortness of breath i'm thinking about these poor kids sitting on buses that are 100 degrees or 105 degrees yep. and you're sitting there sweating profusely because you've got this mask yeah. on and I can understand it. That's, that's, those are that's right. Absolutely, it is. That's right. Absolutely, it is. So I guess coming out of this, Dr. Jack, we are going to we're asking that staff. I think you said we're already working on something to make it very easy to navigate through to, the the language and all that stuff. To, yeah, for parents to be able to file an a health exam or a medical exemption. Right. I, or I think, religious. I'm sorry. Correct. So a lot of parents have already started to to write in to right. principals, etc. It, 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 for the sake of clarity and understanding exactly who is because uh, you know we don't want to we don't want to make teachers and staff the mask Nazis, right. no. okay so, mask, I, not. Um, so we'll make figure out a clean way to figure out exactly who is opted out and may, perhaps provide that to teachers this is something we talked to principals about uh, yesterday uh, just to make it simple as simple as possible uh, so We'll work on that today, try to get it out by COB today, um, do the best we can with that, yeah, good. and then figure out what a good turnaround time is. Uh, you know, we don't, we want to be reasonable in terms of giving parents time because people are busy, right. and, you know, so anyway. So to clarify, if the students are not in the building and it is just staff who are um, if not vaccinated, have at least been given the opportunity for vaccinations, if the children are not in the building, Mm -hmm. are they allowed to remove their mask because i believe they should be able to all right that that was a question that was asked actually of the state superintendent uh yesterday and the answer was when they're inside a school building they are to be masked and april may know a little bit more than i do but that was that that's was the answer says. that we received when we, we asked the question that's what it says in the in the now therefore part unless you you have these exceptions and there were, I mean, there were literally 
30 to 40 what if question to ask them and with all kinds of nuance associated with them. And as our attorney said, there's still plenty in these orders that have not been, uh, there's not real clarity. And so they're trying to figure out what is, what is the clear answers to all of these questions. But it was rapid fire questions yesterday, but that one stood out. And the order does say that when the CDC changes their guidance, that the mandate is lifted? Um, and no, it doesn't say that. It says. Because it's from the state, it's because it's from the state health commissioner. So the state health commissioner, or I would say, I guess, and or the governor would have to rescind the order, which I suspect that they would if CDC changed, but I can't say that for sure. Um, I thought it said somewhere. April, you got it. We should just give her a mic next time. <laughs> yeah. Giving me exercise. So it says the order shall be effective um, August 12th and shall remain in full force and effect until the CDC guidelines for K through 12 schools change unless the order is sooner amended or rescinded. And so what the commissioner said this morning in our meeting is that like all of us, we are watching the trends and watching what happens we are seeing concerning things in our hospitals. And so that will be part of his decision um, as he looks at this order. Okay, thank you. Thanks, April. Um, some of you may have seen a, a joint statement was put out last night from the two um, state senators who co-sponsored this bill that the governor is referring to when he says that we were breaking the law and um both parties uh, i'll just read briefly he completely disregarded this is a quote from um Dunavant. i'm not sure from henrico he completely disregarded science evidence and even the definition position of his own medical specialty board um and um Peter, Mr. Peterson from Fairfax, I take issue with the governor's characterization of our Senate bill. The purpose of the bill was to give local school boards flexibility in adopting mitigation strategies. It did not give some superpower to the governor or his health commissioner who have no role in managing locally owned public schools. Um, those from the two sponsors of the bill that the governor is using to say that we are requiring masks. So with that, I will just. Um, so is the expectation based on everything that we're saying today is that Monday, unless the kids have, uh, or we don't know. Monday, I don't know if we're saying Monday, but we're giving parents time. We're gonna give, we need to give parents time for the opt out piece. Right. But the mandate was as soon as, according to the state soup, as soon as the signature at the paper was in effect. Yeah. So Monday, it's expected that I'm gonna, it will be masked unless. The, uh, anything else you got to say? Anybody? Um, the board has a dutiful responsibility to uphold the law, and that includes mandates from the Virginia Department of Education and state offices. When we took our oaths, we promised to uphold the law and therefore we will. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, Virginia Code section 32.1-27 says, quote, any person willfully violating or refusing, failing or neglecting to comply with any regulation or order of the board or commissioner or any provision of this title shall be guilty of a class one misdemeanor unless a different penalty is specified and if you continue down in there, it talks about the up to $25,000 penalty. Effective immediately, immediately, uh, Monday. And that, that 25000 is per occurrence. Per violation. Per violation, yeah. Mm -hmm. County Public Schools will comply with the public health order to require universal masking in K-12 schools. Masks are required indoors in our schools and on our buses um, through a federal um, regulation. Masks will remain optional outdoors. Please note these allowable exceptions to mask wearing are medical conditions, disabilities, developmental immaturity, 
other health or safety concerns as indicated by the CDC or sincerely held religious objections. Um, there will be more information coming out from the schools today. Yes, ma'am. Um, yesterday in our principal meeting, we worked with principals for developing that form so that will come out from the schools. Okay. Um, for parents to be able to check those options. Yes, um, so they can't hear you. Okay. Yeah, come on, Major. <laughs> You couldn't hear a major. Dr. Warner. So we're working with principals. We had a meeting yesterday. We're developing the form that'll go out to parents um, later today through the weekend. They'll be able to check those options. Okay. And schools will manage those lists in the schools at their level. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah. And we will give parents a week to or I think a week is reasonable, but again, just Keep in mind the mandate is in effect. Okay. Now. Now. Yeah. Anything? Anybody else? Motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. So moved. Meeting adjourned. Yes.